Breakfast on the class is also dedicated in loving memory of Nishmat Mazal Batrina, the holiest of holiest Eshet Chayil, her bitachon and Hashem and her chesed towards every person she met knew no bounds. It's exactly what we're going to speak about in the class today. Also, Breakfast on the class is sponsored anonymously. Thank you. Oh gosh. Oh my gosh. I need someone else to read this. <laughs> Uh, sponsored anonymously. Thank you, Rabbi Fari, for giving us daily chizuk and tools for growth so we could stand in front of HaKadosh Baruch Hu on Yom Kippur as hopefully better people than we were a year ago. May Hashem continue to give you the koach, minuchat nefesh, and right words to continue inspiring all of Am Yisrael and being the incredible leader that you are. Thank you, uh, whoever that was, for publishing those lies. I appreciate it. <laughs> we should be around. Good morning. Good morning, Rabbi Welcome to Breakfast in the Class. Breakfast in the class today is dedicated uh, in loving memory of Max Shalom Alav Hashlom and Nishmat Mordechai Ben Mazal. He loved Torah and Mitzvot and had an unwavering emunah and Hashem sponsored by his wife and children. Also, of course, breakfast in the class dedicated by, uh, um, by this week's weeks, Daniel S. Loeb, Torah Center donors, uh, Diamond donors, Tatiana and Sani Dur in loving memory of Nishmat Sani's father, Eli Dur, Eliyab and Sion and Farida. Dedicated also this entire year, loving memory of Nishmat Ruth Orfali Batadela, sponsored by her family, and the week of Cobra sponsored by David E. Ash in honor of you and your substantial capacity to go today and every day. Azak Baruch Emanuel. Baruch, please only answer. I have many for listening to this live. Baruch Atalunai. Ah, okay. Let's begin. So, we've talked a little bit about <clears throat> we've talked a little bit about it, the idea of Rishon Lehejbon Avonot and I'd like to pick up the thread from that place. The Midrash tells us on the first day of Sukkot and you will take for yourself on the first day. No other place does it use that language and you will take for yourself on the first day. Um, what does it say instead? It says and you'll take for yourself on the 15th day of the month, right? So, instead of calling it the first day, why is it called the first day? The Midrash says, Rishon Lecheshbon Avonot. It's the first day for the reckoning, for the tallying of Avonot, of Averot. And we've already asked, what does that mean? It means that there are no sins, it means that the sins don't count, it means that the Satan is not there. We've expressed and, and spoken about a few different approaches to this idea. Today, I want to maybe take a little a look at a little bit of a different angle on this concept of Rishon Lecheshbon Avonot with you. And I think you'll find it's a very interesting idea. So the, the uh, Rabbi Biderman brings from this Sefer Yeshuot Yaakov, he brings a very interesting answer. He says the Vilna Gaon asks a question on the Mishnah and Avot. The Mishnah and Avot says as follows. A person always needs to remember when you do something wrong, when you're living your life, a person should always remember, Lifnemi ata atid liten din v'cheshbon. You have to remember who it is in front of which you will give din v'cheshbon. Those two words, din, which means a judgment, cheshbon, which means an accounting, they really mean the same thing. So the Vilna Gaon asked, what does that mean? That when the time comes, we will give in front of God Din v'cheshbon, judgment and an accounting. Isn't judgment an accounting? Isn't accounting judgment? The Vilna Gaon answers that there's a difference, a fundamental difference between the two. Din means a, ju- a judgment for what was done incorrectly. Cheshbon means what would I have, what could I have been doing during that time that I was actually doing the sin. Let me give you an example. You have a person uh, who gets a job. Wait, well, supposed to work nine to five. Turns out, boss comes to the office and he sees the guy is sitting there spending two hours of his time helping a competitor's, uh, what's it called, business deal go through on the company's dime. I'm paying you by the hour, right? What are you doing? Instead, you're working for our competition. You're taking the deal from us and you're giving the deal to somebody else to our competition. Now, the boss, I have to be clear, is angry on two fronts. Number one, why are you giving the deal to our competition? 
Number one, that's something that every uh, employee is supposed to do to work to the benefit of that company. That's point number one. Point number two is, all this time that you were spending working for him, you could have been working for me. So not only are you a bad employee in terms of doing something wrong, you also are a bad employee in terms of doing something, not doing something right. That two hour slot, what, you should have been working for me. Din is what did you do wrong, that's the judgment. Cheshbon is, okay, now we have an accounting. How many hours did you spend on something else that you didn't spend on me? And that's not about something positive or negative. It's just about you not doing your job. Says the Yeshuot Yaakov, explains. Yeshuot Yaakov explains. That's what we mean when we say, Reishon Lechesh Bon Avonot. Yom Haddin, Yom Kippur is Din. What did you do wrong? But the minute we finish with the Din, now we have Rishon Lechesh Bon Avonot. Now what do we do instead? We look at, what you could have been doing in that time when you were doing something wrong. Let me explain why this is such a powerful and important concept. We explained that during the time of Yom Kippur, we know a person, their life hangs in the balance. The teshuvah that they are doing is called teshuvah mi'ira, teshuvah from fear. And that can get a person out of uh, hot water, like we say. But when a person does teshuvah mi'ahava from love, the teshuvah not only gets him off of the hook for the sins that he's done, but it even takes the sins that a person's done and turns them into zikhuyot, into positive, uh, into positive merits. So therefore, first we have Yom Hadin, that's the Dina Cheshbon. Then you have Rishon Cheshbon Avonot. Now that you're in the state of mind of Ahava, of love, now we need to go back to every sin that you did and make a Cheshbon. Because if the Cheshbon is about what you could have been doing when you did something wrong, but then I took that thing that you did wrong and I made it into a mitzvah, I need to now reckon those averot and count them for you for mitzvot. Let me share with you something beautiful uh, before we move on to our main point. <clears throat> One of the most beautiful idea, ideas that I ever saw, because it's almost, it's cute, it's sweet, it's beautiful, is that if you take a look, on Rosh Hashanah, what do we do? We go to the water, and we throw our sins in the water. Comes Sukkot, what are we doing? We're drawing the water back into the temple. Weird. Answer the Chachamim, that on Rosh Hashanah, what are we doing? We're throwing our Averot into the water. But after we reach Sukkot and Teshuvah Me'ahava, we want to go back to that water. Find every Averah that you threw in the water. And now go and gather it in. Why? Because you bring it. Nisu chamaim. You pour those averot now on the mizbeach, on the altar of God. My friends, it turns out that in this process, in the process of self-betterment, in the process of working on oneself to eliminate the negatives, right? There, every negative is, is and remains a negative. But the crazy thing is, you have a person who becomes the most refined, most wonderful person, most attentive person. A lot of times, those rock bottom moments that he's experienced, which cause him to become this unbelievable person, not only do they uh, flip, but they actually take him past where he was in the beginning. You have people that unfortunately, they go through a crisis, and it turns out that after the crisis, and working through it, they're in a better place mentally, physically, spiritually, uh, sensitively than they were even before anything happened, even before anything went wrong. So my friends, I want to talk a little bit about this, what, what this looks like, this special time, the time between Rosh Hashanah and Sukkot. The Pasuk tells us when it comes to Sukkot, Kol ezrach b'Yisrael yeshivu basukot. And we always point out that the language is a very curious expression. What does it mean, Ezrach be Israel? Sometimes a friend, Israel, uh, another fellow Israelite, uh, you know, another Jewish person is called Re'echa, you know, your friend. Sometimes it's called, you know, in the Torah, Amitecha. Sometimes it's called, Kiyamuch Achicha. 
All these languages express some form of connection that you have between yourself and another Jew. Then comes Sukkot, and we're reading about called Ezrach Bi Israel. Well, if you have a passport, right, that's what you need. The guy doesn't need to be connected to you, doesn't need to be friends with you, doesn't need to be your neighbor. <laughs> nothing. Not your brother, not your family, nothing. What does he need to be? He needs to just be a Jew, Ezrach. Now listen to this. I think that this is very beautiful. The Pasuk tells us that part of Sukkot is that we're living in a place which is kolet, which brings in every kind of Jew. In fact, this idea is mirrored by the concept of the four species, where you have every type of Jew, however righteous, however not righteous, and one brings them together. The holiday of Sukkot is the holiday of bringing everyone together. And it's not only of bringing everyone together, but as we've expressed already, it's not just that the Rasha can hang out with the Tzaddik. And one has to wonder, what in the world does the Rasha have to do with the Tzaddik? The answer is in a space of Ahava. The Rasha becomes a Tzaddik. His Averot turn him into a Tzaddik. He's not only forgiven. His Teshuvah causes those sins to be rendered into mitzvot, making a person who had max amount of sins through Teshuvah process into mamash a tzaddik. The lulav, excuse me, the arava can be the etrog. I love the idea that Ezrach, which on the surface level tells us this concept, Ezrach be Israel, that the person is the lowest you know, there's no engagement. There's no friendship. There's no connection. You don't share anything in common. And then the word Ezrach just means a citizen. But there's maybe another way of looking at the word Ezrach. Every time you have a word that has an Aleph in the beginning, Erdof, Asig, it means I. Ezrach means I will rise. Sunrise is called Zrichat Hashemesh. You have a person who's holding nowhere. He's done everything wrong. But through the process of Teshuvah, He's describing himself as Ezrach. I will begin to shine. I will rise. That's the idea of a person through the process of love. They quote the Hazon Ish at the time. They asked him, what does a person do with all of Am Yisrael being in this uh, state of mind where they're not necessarily connected to Judaism, to Shabbat, to Mitzvot, to Arat Mishpacha, kosher. What do you do? Back in the day, they would decide or, you know, when someone would be called a mumar, when someone is called not out of the, out of the tribe of Israel, like when they've ex like excluded themselves. He says, but in today's day and age, our job is to reach out to them. With the ropes of love, he says. With love, a person could reach a person that is so far away. So this idea, the concept of Ahava, it, it illustrates, it, underco it, uh, it, uh, it is the undercurrent of everything that we're experiencing. Now, let me just say something I think, please don't take it the wrong way. Mechila. I'm just going to put that in the beginning. You have people that are very dialed into Jewish concepts, but have never actually given a second to think where that Jewish concept actually lands. Like, can I just get a show of hands? How many people here know that Sukkot is the time of Teshuvah Me'ahava? Anyone? Did you ever hear that before? It's the time of repentance through love. Kippur is repentance through fear. Teshuvah Me'ahava is Sukkot. Anyone hear that before? No? Some people? Yes, maybe not. Okay. So that's a very famous idea. But let me share this because I think that this is magnificent. All right? That's why we say Hoshana Rabbah is the final day of judgment, right? So you have Teshuvah Mi'ir'ah, and then you shift into Teshuvah Mi'ava, and the end point of Sukkot is Hoshana Rabbah, the great Savior, the great saving day, right? Saving grace is that we've had this opportunity to be able to shift. Now, imagine someone, they come and look at something from, I don't want to say a shallow level, because that sounds horrible, right? But sh a shallow level. Let me give you just a simple example. Imagine, a person walks into a store, and the guy tells him, listen, you see this whole store over here? 
You could have any two items in the whole store. You could have for free. You could choose anything. Whatever you like, in this room it's yours. Anyway, okay, the guy goes, he chooses a nice suit, okay? That's his one gift. And he says, okay, so what's your second gift? The guy says, I want to choose a plastic bag to carry the suit in. <laughs> now, any normal person would understand that when the guy's offering you anything in the store, very expensive store, he's offering you anything for free, he's obviously going to throw in a bag. No, right? Obviously. Not in the cheap stores, right? Not in the cheap stores. But a guy who goes to a fancy store, not only are they giving you a bag, it's, you know, they're giving you, they're giving you a garment bag and a this and a that. My friends, the guy's a moron. But that's not the only reason why he's a moron. Because there's something maybe better that he could choose than the suit. If I would be in there, I would choose the cash register. <laughs> right? But maybe the guy's not such a moron because who carries cash? <laughs> I just love, you know when a world turns upside down. Right? So it used to be there was a time, um, there was a time when they were shifting from cash into cards. And then we shifted from using cards into using your phone, right? That's how, how we, you know, we kind of you know, moved along the progression. I went to a game a while back, and in the stadium, the stadium is now cashless. So just listen to the absurdity of where we're at. So since the stadium is cashless, if you want to buy a soda for $75, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you want to buy a soda, right? That, by the way, my favorite thing is after you buy the soda for $75, they only give it to you open. Right. And so, so you know what I did? Immediately, I uh, called that into my uh, tax uh, attorney, and he listed that as a diminishing asset. <laughs> right? Either way, point is, so you, you go to the, what's it called? I went to this place, and now you can't buy anything with money. So what do you do? There's a machine. It's a reverse ATM. You put cash in it, and it gives you a card so that you can use the card so that... Wow. Is that, the that is the truth. I love that you felt you needed to ask me if I was saying the truth. <laughs> <laughs> the truth and nothing but the truth. Hilarious. So we live in an upside-down world. So maybe in a cashless world, maybe it's a bad idea to go grab the, uh, to grab the cash register, okay? But my friends, imagine a scenario like that. The guy could choose anything, and what is he choosing? He's choosing an object when he could choose something that's much more valuable than the object, because he's looking on the surface. He's thinking, I need a bag to carry it. Of course the guy's gonna give you the bag. You're not clocking what's really going on over here. If he likes you enough, to give you two free objects in the store, you don't have to burn one of them on a bag. Yeah? That's missing the point. So many times people talk about this and they miss the point. You know why it's a time of teshuva me'ahava? Because it's a time of ahava. <laughs> you see what I mean when I say shallow understanding? You'll take a concept which is reliant on a much deeper concept and run with the small bit and not understand the un... So often this is the case when people are doing sigulot. Completely missing the idea and engaging with the most surface level of the object and really not clocking what's going on underneath. Just oftentimes I, I wish that this would, be, this would happen. You know, people will gather together and they'll do a uh, challah bake. And it should be a big zikhut. And is it a big zikhut? Of course, everybody did a mitzvah. Beautiful zikhut. You know what would be a much bigger zikhut? If you spend 10 minutes at the chalabek instead of chatting, learning about why a chalabek is important and what its powers are and why this mitzvah is a zikhut and what is the zikhut and what does it mean? Then you're tapping into the, the real, what the real element here is. My friends, Sukkot is a time of Ahava. From HaKadosh Baruch Hu to the Jewish people. God says, come into the house, I'm going to protect you. That's literally what a Sukkah is. The Sukkah is the Sukkah Tiyeh 
litzel, for a protect for a protection, for a roof, for a shadow. God says, "Come stand in my shade. I'm going to protect you." That describes Ava. So imagine a person saying, "Oh my gosh, this is the holiday of protection." No, no, it's a holiday of love. It's where God exhibits tremendous love to the Jewish people. Because there is love, there is protection. Is there anything more basic in the concept of love than the desire, the will, and the need to protect? My friends, if that's the case, we understand that it's not a time of teshuva me'ahava. It's a time of ahava, within which people do teshuva. Now we're understanding why the sukkah is able to uh, be kolet, to bring in any kind of Jew. Because in the world of deen and fear, there, is, there are differentiations. In the world of love, what do you see? You only see that person's potential. Love is capable of bringing in someone who's not holding. Deen is not. My friends, if that's the case, we understand why the parasha is communicating not only in the sukkah, not only in its lulav etrog hadasim and aravot, but it's also communicating a time of tremendous tzedakah. Not tzedakah from a place of tzedakah. Tzedakah from a place of love. I once went to speak at an event. It's very nice. I'm going up there, you know, in the summer. As I get up there, someone puts an iced coffee on the thing for me. Thank you very much. Someone else brings me up a big cup of water. Thank you very much. Someone else puts two bottles on the thing of the shtender. Thank you very much. Someone else puts on the chair that I was sitting on before. I just got up. There's water. I'm surrounded. Okay. Surrounded by liquid. <laughs> anyway, so I made a shot call, and it was comical, because I drank from the iced coffee, and then I drank from the water on the thing, and then I drank from the water under the thing, and then I drank from the water behind, and then I drank from the... So everyone started laughing. <laughs> Look at this. This is fantastic. This is really experiencing it. Yeah? Here we go, here we go, here we go. All right, here we go, here we go. Why was I drinking from all the cups? What's wrong with that water, for that water, this water, that water, the other water? There's nothing to do, I don't need another cup of water. But if someone took the time to get you some water, even if I could satisfy my thirst with only that one, what about, you know, how do you acknowledge, how do you appreciate, how do you take in that which someone did for you what do you do? You drink from all the cups. That's how it works. On Sukkot HaKadosh Baruch Hu drinks from all the cups. That's Nisu Chamaim. The people collectively come and they pour water on the Mizbeach. And Hashem drinks from the cups of every type of person. That space is the space of Ahava. And if that's the case, my friends, if that's where God is, like the Pasuk says, Hashem Tzilcha Al Yad where God is giving you that level of protection and that level of love, what is your response supposed to be to God acting in that way, in that time? You ever have a person who just does not have social awareness and meet someone like that? You know, everyone's like, oh, yay! Oh, it's amazing. Oh, that day is now we had the best time. Everyone is, <coughs> everyone's here, yeah? Then that person comes in and they're like, oh, I hear they're raising taxes. <laughs> what do you got to go and do that? What do you got to ruin? Right, what? Someone goes in and brings in some very contentious point on politics. Everyone's like, <laughs> like, you know, catch the vibe. Like, you know, pay attention. Tone deaf. Listen to this. When God is in a space of Ahava, where should the Jewish people be? A space of Ahava. Not only with regards to Him. Oh, 
the nature of Ahava, the nature of a, uh, and again, I, again, I'm saying this, please, please understand what I'm saying in the context I'm saying it in. With love. Yeah, with, with the most love. Shema. You ever meet a person who's super religious, you know, praying with such devotion, like, like praying to Hashem, and you could see how much he loves God. And then he turns around and he's like, Hey! You know what we call a person who, whilst expressing extreme joy in one direction, could then express extreme anger in another direction? Either bipolar, okay, or, or psychotic. Right? A chasid shoteh is psychotic. Understand, understand that. If you're capable of having ahava here, and then within that space having such anger and hatred and animosity, it means that you as a person are disconnected from your emotion. Why when someone shifts that way do we call that psychotic? Because the person and his emotional uh, state of mind are uncoupled. How did you go from there to there? It's uncoupled. That's that person that winds up shooting up a post office. Okay? My friends, if you're in a state of ahava with God, you must be in a state of ahava with? With man. You must be. If not, you're lying about one of them. So, once we understand that, we recognize the power and the value of this time being a time of klita, of having, having guests in the sukkah. So someone asked me, Rabbi, you know, sukkah is a little bit difficult. You know, you have to go inside and outside and this and that. Is it like, is it okay if I don't have guests on sukkah? I'll just have them on the Shabbat after sukkah. I said, you could do whatever you like. I said, but it doesn't make sense. I said, what do you mean? I said, can I give you a mashal? He said, yes. I said, for your wife to wear a white gown to an event that has so many people at it, where there's going to be food and drink and sweat, sounds like a little crazy. Maybe she should wear her wedding, guest, wedding dress, not to the wedding, but to like a few days later when it's just the two of you at home. Like, doesn't... Sounds illogical to wear a white wedding dress at such a public event. Maybe she should wear something else on that day and use the white. That's absurd. Isn't it absurd? How absurd is it to say no to guests on Sukkot because it's a little bit challenging to go into the sukkah, out of the sukkah, to drag the things. You don't know if it's going to rain. You'd be inside, outside. But that's the time of Ahava. That's when it's meant to be. That's called Ezra Bisele Yishuba Sukkot. My friends, this time is a time to push your Ahavat Yisrael to the max. Not like Tisha B'Av, where you're using your Ahavat Yisrael to get something that you want, i.e. Geula, i.e. the Beit HaMikdash. But because it's a time of Ahava, it's a time of making sure to be able to see that everyone around you is okay. It's a time to be distributing tzedakah. It's a, it's a time to be welcoming people in, into the sukkah. And I want to end by saying this. I read a crazy example of this. Um, uh, in, uh, in Rav Biederman's Be'er uh, uh, Haim. There was a woman, she worked for a very, very long time for, the, uh, for a certain rabbi. And she gave her life to the synagogue. You know, every synagogue has one of theirs, you know. The person that's given decades of their life, they're as much a part of the furniture as the furniture. All right. One day, they have one daughter, her, this woman, and her husband. And the daughter really is, uh, is suffering from some strange illness that no one can figure out what it is. Everyone is... Uh, trying their best to understand, the doctors, the thing, that. No one can, 
Anyway, the rabbi says, please come with your husband. Bring your husband to my office. I'd like to do some prayers. I'd like to try and intervene on your behalf for your daughter. She goes to convince her husband. Her husband's not a Hasidish guy. He's like, wow, we're kind of going to go to a Rebbe. Not my, not my thing. Anyway, she pushes, she pushes, she pushes. Until finally the guy agrees. He comes. And he sits down and the rabbi says, tell me the name. He writes out a little piece of paper. He folds it up. He says, please keep this with her wherever she goes as a Kamea. Now, just to be clear, 90 whatever percent of Kameas that you'll receive were made in China. Like understand that it's bogus. You know, it's not, the, 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 not only is the Kamea not real, the person who wrote a few is not real, right? You gotta, these are very, it's rare to find someone that, that you'd want to use any Kamea that they'd give you, okay? But we have examples of great Sadiqim that did whatever they did, wrote whatever they wrote, and it became like a protection for that person to carry around. Now, he says, please write, he says, don't tell anybody. It has to be kept absolute secret. You know, anyway. So fine, the, the, give it to the daughter. Before they've even walked out the door, she'd have me- very tough, very difficult mental challenges. Before they even walked out of the door of the rabbi's office, they could see that the girl's uh, state of mind is improving. On the way out of the house of the rabbi, the daughter says to her mother, I'm so sorry, mom, for all that I'm putting you through, all that this is costing you, how difficult this is for you. She starts to apologize and own her behavior. Wild. They can't believe it. They don't say anything. They go home day by day. The, the recovery is miraculous. Guy doesn't open his mouth, doesn't say a word. Years go by. The father is at a wedding. He has one too many to drink. Someone asks him about the story. And he says, well, the rabbi, he gave us this piece of paper. And since that day, she's been better. And he tells the secret that the rabbi said never to reveal. On that same day, whatever it was that this girl had, came back. In the language of the rabbi, Mada hava hava. What happened, happened. But years later, someone opened up this Kamea. And you know what it said in the Kamea? This is fascinating. And to me, the story is not about the Kamea. Or Kameas in general. Or whether or not they're legit. He writes, Ahoti, Rayati, Tamati, Yonati. These are four expressions in Shira Shirim used to describe God. And the rabbi is writing to God like he's his friend. How close he is to Hashem. And he begs Hashem to uh, bring Rufu'ash to this woman. Why? Because she served the community for so many years. In the Beit Knesset, etc., etc. And then he says, in the Zechut of, and he writes the names of two people from the community. This, ra- this man and this man. Anyway... The person who opens this Kameh all those years later, he goes to find out, he's like, who are these people that the rabbi is saying that she should have her fuash in their merit? They do a little research, and it turns out they're not rabbis. They're not chachamim, roshe yeshiva, roshe kolel, poskim. Who were they? They were two people who worked for the community in raising tzedakah funds. They were the people that everyone crossed the street to get to the other side when you saw them because you know the guy is going to hit you up. He's collecting for Kala. He's collecting for Fuash for Bikur Cholim. He's collecting for this. Collecting for the food fund. Collecting for Bikur Cholim. He's collecting for the center, for DSN, Mabarev, Hillel, the bridge, the bridge to Hillel, etc., etc., etc. The guy is collecting for anything and everything. He's the man. If ever you needed someone to collect money, who's the guy? Him. In our community, who would this person be? Harry Ajmi. At every single fundraiser. Yeah? Okay. My friends, the guy writes, in the merit of... They asked the rabbi, what? Of all the sadiqim, this is who you have? And the rabbi said this. 
He says, after they went to all the doctors and no one could find anything, it was obvious that we needed a miracle. If we needed a miracle, we needed to hear voices in the Shamaim whose voices are unequivocal that what they say happens. Who are those people, he said? The people who gave everything for Am Yisrael. The biggest zechut, he says, are the people who gave everything for Am Yisrael. And if they declare, and in their zechut, this person is supposed to have Fuah Shema, she'll have her Fuah Shema. They gave everything for Am Yisrael. Now to me, the story I said, not about the Kameah. It's not about this, not about that. You know what it's about? That in choosing zechut, who the rabbi choose? He chose people that gave everything for the tzibur. Their zechut is unimaginable. And why? Why? Because to get somebody help that they need, which lane are you in? You're in the lane of Ahava. In the lane of Ahava, my friends, what's the greatest mitzvah we could do? Ahava. Caring for someone, helping that person. So this time is a tremendous time for the mitzvah of tzedakah, for the time of showing love, care, and concern for people. Less religious, not religious, sisters, brothers-in-law, all that kind of thing. Yom Kippur is when you forgave your brother-in-law. Yom Kippur is when you forgave your mother-in-law. Yom Kippur is when your mother-in-law forgave you. Okay? Sukkot is when you break bread together, when you start developing that ahava again. And it's a time which is misugal for it, which means that if a person is trying to do it, Hashem will grease the wheels. Hashem should bless us, Be'ezrat Hashem, not only to be, like we said yesterday, two days ago, men of God, but also to be men of the people, people who appreciate people, who understand people, who see the best in people, who give all of ourselves to people. Baruch Amen Amen. Rabbi